All right, we're talking here about um, a chart that distinguishes between a stage one and a stage two. It's a very general um, idea at first, these contrasts that we're going to refer to. Um, I haven't really prepared how to introduce the different stages, but we could say that stage one is the typical mainstream stage and stage two is a post mainstream stage. Um, anybody who's already looked at the table can interrupt or comment at any time. We have a few other people um, on the recording here uh, and um, <clears throat> many of these people are already familiar with all of the references in the stage one and stage two. Um, so I'm going to make the general comment uh, that stage one is complex for the most part. The top left corner, you have a lot of long stuff in the stage one. In the stage two on the top right, shorter answers. It's simple. Study how things operate. Study how things work. You see that pattern on the top right over and over. Even as you get into the lower right, it's still study how things work. Study how how to manage time well. Study how uh, to manage finances well. Study legal systems. These are kind of like priorities in terms of starting with the higher priorities, working the way down towards you know things that might not be a priority to most people but eventually could be a priority. So health is higher than uh, time management. But of course, time management's related to health. Time management is also related to stress and managing stress. So that's you, you can't really totally isolate any of these things from the other. So we just have for convenience a set of contrasts um, on the right. Generally speaking, that that se that second stage is really getting focused on how things work, being attentive and mindful to what actually works. What's going on? How's it work? Stage one, the mainstream, there's a lot of attention to um, complexity. There's a lot of room for confusion, a lot of um, room for frustration, because if we take on a confusing presumption, or an expectation, then we go out into life and life doesn't fit our expectation. There's two things we can do when life doesn't fit our expectation. Generally speaking, there's, there's only two things we can do. What are those two things? Who wants to answer? What's one of the two things? Life doesn't fit my expectations. What's one of the things I can do? Agonize. Say more. Um, just whine and complain about how life doesn't fit your expectations and agonize over it. Okay. Agonize over it exactly how? Um, I don't know. Whine about it? Complain about it? Um, okay. So you could say that the social aspect of whining and complaining is, is simply to draw attention to oneself and draw attention to the to the contrast between expectations and um, what actually is happening. Uh, Dan or anybody else want to take on what are the alternatives as far as um, what to do with the with the contrast between expectations and experience, or exactly what is the agonizing that people can do or that is is common for people to do. Who wants to address that? Anybody? Well, uh, yeah, agonizing. I guess you could just kind of um, focus on the same things over and over again. You know, basically things that aren't very relevant to the current moment, which is quite interesting. So I guess I don't know what you mean by how they would agonize, but mm -hmm. we'd be focusing on... Okay, pick a, pick a topic. It doesn't have to be off of the list. Just something from Facebook, something from your life, anything, uh, you know, a recent event. I thought of something, but I want you to, you to pick a topic. Go ahead. Something that was surprising. It didn't fit your expectations. 
Um, recent event or recent news item. Robin Williams. Exactly. So, uh, how how could people agonize over it? I. I know. Oh, go ahead. Well, I don't know. I think he's trying to say to keep reliving it over and over again, you know. But I, I don't know. What was the question again? Okay, so I have an expectation. In the case of Robin Williams, my expectation is that he would be alive today, right? That would be a reasonable expectation. He, we thought he's healthy. We thought all these things. We expect him to be alive. We find out he's dead, and we find out that suicide is part of the, you know, uh, report. And I don't. I think uh, Dan Dan may be the only one who saw the the reference to a little more besides the strangulation issue outside of just a straight suicide. But you know, I don't want to get too far into the topic. But like, we expect him to be alive. We expect everybody to be alive. They were alive yesterday. We expect him to be alive today. If I don't know who else recently died that's a celebrity or anything else. But when people die. Generally speaking, we're surprised unless they've been dying for months or years, and then we're like, well, we just does a matter of time. But if Robin Williams dies, we expect him to be alive, and how can we agonize over the news of his death? What is a way that people could agonize about it? So this was more directed towards Dan. I'm going to offer it back up to Shelly. Do you have any comment, Shelly? Um, no. Okay, so how we agonize can be how do I get reality to be like my expectations? And that is a huge challenge, right? I'm going to take how the reality is, I'm going to dis, uh, devalue it, and say my expectations are, are, are more important to me than reality, um, and I'm going to try and alter reality now to conform to my expectations. So how can I prevent suicide? Oh, I want to donate money to the hotline, and I want to, you know, uh, you see all the ways that people respond to the news of the suicide. Uh, and I don't know if Shelly is aware of the, you know, I assume you've seen on Facebook or otherwise some reports about, Robin Williams' death. Yes. Um, so are you aware that one way people can relate to it is to agonize over what do we need to do differently to fix this from ever happening again? So, it, you know, or for, for instance, does that make sense? Yes. Dan? Yes, that makes sense. Comments or questions? So um, we could also agonize over, well, why did he, why did this happen? I didn't expect him to die. What's the truth of this matter? And I don't want to get into that in this, in this call, but if somebody wants to research, you know, we know what his publicist said. What's the police report say? Someone can read that. So I don't want to get into that content, like I said right now, but if somebody wants to know about a specific case, I didn't expect Robin Williams to intentionally kill himself, well then they, that's not agonizing to research it. They can actually just research it. They can say, well let me update my expectations, let me update my understanding of what actually happened. They can research it. Um, so the general thing that you can do if there's a contrast between your expectations and reality is you can cling to your expectations or you can learn, by which I mean alter your expectations. That's it. There's really not a lot of alternatives uh, on a general sense. Stage one of this defending the mainstream, I don't know what, ideals or expectations, in defending the mainstream ideas, there can be a lot of energy and not a lot of productivity. It can, you know, a lot of resources can, and a lot of time on Facebook, you know, uh, how do we fix society so no one ever commits suicide in the future of humanity because it's it's a tragedy that I you know we just can't have this happen anymore we've got to stop the following list of things that should never happen 
That is agonizing. And that's a really heavy kind of agonizing. So Shelly, um, you mentioned agonizing. Does, does, do you want to comment on what I just said further? Uh, no, that makes sense, what you just said. Okay. So there are lighter and heavier versions of agonizing. That's why I kept asking you to give a little more detail about how exactly. So um, if we're agonizing over how do we go from the despair of this horrible, tragic, sad thing to fixing reality so that reality is safe for me, that's agonizing. Now, that might, I could repeat that. So if I have a sense that reality isn't safe for me, something's wrong and I want reality to change so that reality is, goes from being unsafe to safe, that's agonizing. The other perspective is reality has varying amounts of safety and risk and I'm interested in being clear about risk and safety and moving towards safety but not like I have to change reality first. I just want to know what's safe and what's unsafe. If it's unsafe for me to drive 90 miles an hour in a motorcycle uh, uh, on Gant, you know, then what I could do is slow down. Or what I could do is find a really secluded place to, if I want to go that fast, find a secluded place where it's safe to do that. I don't need to make it safe to drive 90 miles an hour. That's, that's such a crazy thing in the, in the motorcycle 90 mile an hour driving analogy, but in many cases people respond to um, a conflict with their expectations by intense agonizing and that is a really interesting pattern. Okay, comments or questions? I'm, I'm ready to move into the stage one and stage two, but I want to give people an opportunity to comment or ask any questions first. Yeah, I, uh, I see, you know, of course, some of the agonizing you're talking about, you know, can be sometimes with, you know, what I do. Uh, also, with a lot of the uh, things you read on Facebook, even about Robin Williams or, or different things, I guess, I see that other people also, you know, are agonizing I don't know if it's the heavy form or, you know, the life form, whatever, but just based on their language, you can see that they're, you know, they're going over the same ideas about reality that they don't like and they want to change. And yeah. so, yeah, I can see in other people as much as I see it in myself at times. Yep. Yep. And, and grieving and grief um, are challenging emotions or challenging transitions. And there's a lot that we can learn from them. I don't intend, uh, maybe I'll come back to it later in this discussion, but I didn't intend to get into, um, you know, suicide or uh, grief or agonizing. Any of those things weren't really my intent. I just wanted to make reference to the fact that we, it's completely normal to have expectations. For somebody to say, well, I don't want to have any expectations. That's stupid. I don't want to have any presumptions. That's, 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 that's not an intelligent response. I can understand why people might have that, why I might have had it at times, but the idea of I'm going to eliminate all expectations one at a time <laughs> or all at once, it's just silly. Um, so the problem of expectations not conforming to reality and reality not conforming to expectations, what if it's not a problem? What if that's just an opportunity for me to refine and update my expectations? No problem, just learning. Or maybe occasional problems. Maybe it's a little challenging and sometimes I need to go to a to a expert on a subject and say, I can't figure this out. This really got me troubled. I'm really concerned. Maybe you know, we have occasions where there'll be a, a school shooting or something, and then some of the students will get um, counseling about, you know, how to cope with the death of all these people. And are those good things or bad things? I don't know, but they are uh, um reasonable things. Like it's understandable that people would get triggered. Some people will get really triggered by Robin Williams' death. What, which people? Well, maybe people who uh, recently lost a loved one by way of suicide. Like it just makes sense. Some people are going to get triggered and they do want to explore it. So I don't mean to say agonizing is even wrong, but um, to explore grief in a way that's productive and healthy, typically does not require any agonizing at all.
Agonizing is just a sign of grief that's unresolved. We could think of it that way. Uh, again, I, I'm ready to move on, but I do want to give people an opportunity to comment on that before I do. Go ahead. Anyone? <clears throat> so we have stage one and stage two. Um, Shelly, are you looking at the, um, the document, the link? Yes. Would you be willing to read that very top left uh, one that starts with Santa? Um, under stage one? Yeah. Santa, differentiate or different behaviors in rewards or punishments. The you missed, figure of, back up. What? You missed oh, the word sorry. result. Start oh, again sorry. more slowly, please. Santa, different behaviors result in rewards or punishments. The figure of Santa... The inaccessible authority is used to justify postponing rewards. Okay, so I want to take a little time to explore what I mean by this. I wrote this. Um, so different behaviors result in rewards or punishments, meaning um, a child who is good gets rewarded for good behavior if they, you know, they do whatever their parents want them to do. Um, punishments aren't very common in the case of uh, Christmas gifts, but we are probably aware of those stories of coal and things like that. Um, the figure of Santa is used to justify postponing rewards in the following way. Um, I'm, in the, I'm in the toy store, I'm in the aisle, my, my child is, is with me or several children are with me and they say, that's what I want, I saw it on the ad on TV, I want that, I want that, I want that. And what do we say that's postponing the purchase of the toy or that's it's it's interrupting their their nagging their whining what do we say in regard to santa go ahead anybody put it uh, on your christmas list uh, there, yep <laughs> put it on your christmas list okay well it's um in the in the recent recording i did i said it's only december 19th johnny december 25th is when santa brings the present mm -hmm. so if that's something you want then you need to tell Santa and be very good. Calm down. Don't jump up and down. Get up off the floor. Don't swing your legs on the floor. I want you to stand up and walk down the aisle calmly. Quiet down. And if you and look, you see that security camera up there in the corner? You know, you're like in Walmart or whatever. You see that security camera? Santa can see you right now. And if you're bad in the aisle and you and you keep being disruptive. I don't know if you're going to get what's on your Christmas list, but if you're a good boy or a good girl, then uh, we'll have, you know, we'll have Christmas gifts under the under the tree in just six more days. And I don't know if if uh, Santa will give you that because I don't. I'm. I'm. It's not like I'm Santa or something. I don't know if Santa's going to get you that, but um, but that'll be really interesting to find out. So we're postponing the, the delivery of the gift. We're postponing the whole issue through Santa. Um, I assume that's clear? Any comments? So basically it's like a bribing system for your kids. That's pretty cool. It is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should, note it. we should note here that uh, Dan's son, Daniel, is on the call. We heard him barely. We couldn't hardly hear you, Daniel. Um, but, uh, um, let's, let's think, so, D Daniel, I want to put, I want to put you on the spot for a second. This is going to be a yes or no question though. Did your, do you remember your dad misleading you about Santa Claus? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, do you remember your your other lots of other people misleading you about Santa Claus? Yep. That's a yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, do you remember like again? This is yes or no, but this is leading to an open answer question, just as a warning. <laughs> um, do you remember when you really got you know Santa is not what people have been telling me? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How did you find out? Like, short version. How did you? What What happened? How did you get it? I don't see some magical guy come down my chimney. You were watching. Well, you were watching the chimney, and nobody came down. Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How old were you? Eight. Eight. Uh huh. 
Cool. So until you were eight, you had at least some some uh, some wonder about is this real? Is this not real? You know, at least you you, you thought it was possible. I guess. Um, yeah. I had an older sibling, so I don't think I got that far uh, to age eight. Uh, I'm almost sure that I didn't. But um, anyway, so it is an interesting thing that. Uh, it's relatively easy to uh, present information to children, and children, in many cases, will um, believe it. And that is the foundational reference, the you know the the core reference that I wanted to make in regard to all the contrasts that I'm going to set up here. So on the top right is stage two, and. In contrast to the Santa thing, and you know, we don't need to use the Santa um, story in dealing with children, but it's perfectly, you know, useful with some kids. It just it works. Um, so I'm not against it in the, in any way. By you know, in case anybody cares, um, the stage two issue is, or how I'm, I'm setting up stage two. It's not even about, it doesn't matter about Santa. So it's not like saying Santa's wrong or the whole, you know, it's not, uh, uh, I'm embarrassed about, I was tricked, none of that kind of stuff. Stage two, study how communication works, study how social influence operates. In particular, the form of social influence involving language. And obviously communication involves language, but communication is not just words. It it, uh, it it still is communication to like, you know, when you write on the gift of the present from Santa, well, those are words, but when you wrap up that gift with different wrapping paper, if you're that smart, which you probably don't need to be because kids don't care, but if somebody goes to the trouble of wrapping Santa's gifts in different paper, well, that's still to set up the idea that they were not wrapped by the same people, you know? Um, so and so communication can, can include the clothes you wear, just, you know, your, your, your uh, uh, posture, your gestures, all sorts of things, your voice tone, all sorts of things that are not literally your words. So um, the first part of the chart, all the stuff on the top right is kind of boring, I'd say. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on, on the top right, but um, I'm going to pause now in case someone does. I would say that, you know, if, if, you, if you're, do, you're in stage two and you're, you're paying attention to that and learning and studying all the different things, there probably isn't a lot of time for agonizing, nor should there be, you know. So it doesn't seem like, you know, it's just a simple jump from agonizing to uh, attentiveness, mindfulness. Well, um, this is getting ahead in a way, but consider that we are programmed culturally, pretty much all of us, including in schools, but not just schools. This happened hundreds of years ago, long before there were you know school systems like that. People are programmed to have certain expectations. It's it's almost inevitable, really. Like you can't go from age two to age five without having some new expectations, changing some old ones. That's just what's going to happen. Um, so people have their expectations, and we can be um, discouraged from using logic, at least in regard to certain subjects. We can be discouraged from exploring certain emotions because they're too disruptive or inconvenient for the social setting. Um, so if we're suppressed emotionally and if our, if our logical, our natural logical wondering about Santa, if we, if we keep being distracted from it and discouraged about it and just pounded with information about, no, Santa is real, Santa is coming, S make your list, we're going to go see Santa this Saturday, um, if there's all this constant repetition of a certain presumption, then agonizing is kind of the natural result. An intelligent person eventually is going to experience doubt and agonizing. In, in other words, they're going to they're gonna have to, they're going to be present to the immense conflict between what they've been told and what's, what's 
what their actual experience is, what their suspicions are, etc. So we're set up for conflicts, and agonizing is a... Uh, it's, it's kind of a perpetuating of an existing conflict, but it's, uh, it's definitely a sign that there's some conflict in the background, or else people wouldn't agonize. Comments or questions? <coughs> so we can come back to the issue of agonizing later, as, as, as desired. Um, so the stage one, the next thing down, um, uh, Dan, would you read that, if you have it in front of you? Yes, schools practicing memorization and blind conformity results in the glory of good grades and avoiding shame. Okay, I've also talked about this, you know, recently and for quite a while. We get the multiple choice tests, oh, so we get the curriculum. The I was a teacher, um, for those who don't know, not at length, and I taught math, so the curriculum wasn't as big of an issue as it might be for other kinds of classes. Um, but we, we are given curriculum and, as teachers, and then uh, the teachers know they're going to have their students tested on, what do you call it, um, competence tests, or I forget what they're called, but you know they have those standardized tests every year or every couple years or whatever. So the teachers know that the teachers are going to be assessed based on their students' test results. Or at least in many cases, that's what teachers can expect. So teachers are given curriculum. Uh, we practice memorization. Students are encouraged to practice memorization and then repeat back whatever they've, they've been told is the right way to spell the word color. So if you're born in Britain and then you move to Boston at age nine, and you're used to spelling color, C-O-L-O-U-R, because that was correct when you were in Britain, you come to the U.S. and they mark it wrong because the U isn't the American English way of spelling color. So it's just conventions or, or uh, conforming to what everybody else expects and what everybody else is doing, which is what conventions mean, basically. So we're trained in conventions. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the, what schools, you know, you take 40 or 35 students in a classroom, that's a great setting for people to be delivered or instructed conventions. Here's conventions. Repeat the conventions back after you memorize them. Write it down on the test. Great. Let's move on. Next class. Next, next test. Whatever. That's what school, that's one of the things that in, you know, big schools are good at, or big class sizes are good at. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different thing than a small class size, or than a, you know, a private, you know, music lesson for one student and one instructor, or something, or or three students and one instructor. Um, so the avoiding shame element is the idea that if you get a bad grade that your parents will find out, the report card will go home and your parents will find out, or you'll get put in that one class, or during the spelling bee, everybody stands up in front of the room, but the people who lose quickly have to sit down and everybody can see it. So there may not be a big element of shame in, in, uh, in schools, and even with the example I just gave, it's not really shaming somebody to say, well, you lost the spelling bee, now it's, you, know, you sit down now. That's not really going out of the way to shame somebody, but a lot of uh, a lot of the schools that I went to had a lot of room for students to shame each other for any number of reasons, including academic performance. And because I was an overachiever, or you know, really focused on academic performance, uh, my sister and I were very competitive. Um, some of the other students uh, that were similarly skilled were very competitive with me, and we, we had a, uh, what do you call it, a friendly rivalry, but um, when you take a friendly rivalry amongst 8-year-olds or amongst 15-year-olds, occasionally it can get heated. Even you think about sports. How can the, the Florida Gators and the Florida State Seminoles have such intensity about football? Why is there so much rivalry and so much, you know, some people 
so much like emotion. Well, uh, uh, we don't need to get into that, but the fact is there can be really intense emotions, and if my team lost, it can be humiliating. Or if my if I got a D and I had I failed the the grade and I had to repeat, you know, fourth grade, uh, that's hum that some people experience that as humiliating. So probably in school settings, uh, suspensions aren't especially humiliating, really. Um, but failing a grade or not getting a diploma for high school, those would be kind of like those would be things where it's 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 not necessarily that somebody's singled out and shamed by the school, but there are contexts where it's normal for people to to be sensitive about those things. They might be ashamed if they do not memorize what the teachers teach in the curriculum and then regurgitate it back on the tests. You have 30 minutes to put all your answers down and pass the test and you know if, if somebody can't do that then they don't get the rewards, they don't get into college, they don't get all of the you know the you can't play college sports if you don't have at least a C average or whatever. So there's all these sets of rewards and tests and uh, in, maybe not a lot of punishments in the case of schools, but nevertheless, when you have a competitive social environment, kids will teach each other, tease each other. Um, they'll tease each other about clothes, they'll tease each other about grades, about, you know, you blurted out blah blah blah, you know, in the middle of class. Um, uh, somebody asked, you know, let's imagine a situation where the teacher writes on the board seven letters and say, okay, who can make those seven letters into a word? Um, if, you, if you make a real word, I'm going to give you a point and we'll write them down. And people go through the class and people shout out, you know, their words and the teacher says, that's right, Johnny, and that's right, Ann, oh, good one, Bob, and they go through and then, and then says, oh, that's not a word to someone else. There's a, there's a potential for <coughs> the teacher to actually set up a dynamic where one student or a few students can be singled out. Um, they can be singled out for bad behavior, they can be singled out for poor academic performance, uh, you know, your, t your shirt is offensive to our school, we're going to send you home, you have to change shirts because your shirt has Florida Gator on it and you're at Leon High School, that's disruptive to the classroom. That was a joke for Shelly. Um, um, so, lots of comments there. Anybody clear? Anybody want to add anything to what I said? Anybody not clear or anybody want to add anything to what I said? Go ahead. Going once, going twice, and gone. All right, so another context besides schools would be um, more personalized explorations. There's, again, there's nothing wrong with big programs, a hundred people in a classroom at a time, thirty people in a classroom at a time. If you want to become a pilot, though, do you go to a class with thirty people and just big classes? You might go to a class with thirty people for your initial training or your initial instruction, but eventually you have much more individualized learning. Um, on the on the right of the chart of the table, stage two is coaching and discussion. So we're in a discussion now. Even if I'm talking for the most part at any given time, this is a discussion format where anybody can, you know, ask questions. Anybody can make comments. Um, coaching would mean one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions, or sometimes you could have like three coaches and one person, like three mentors all together all at once with one person so you can even reverse that normal ratio of having lots of students to one teacher and occasionally have a few specialists or experts providing uh, direction and um, uh, feedback to one person like in the case of a PhD program a doctoral dissertation group that's typically a few people um, that are specialists are providing um, feedback to the one student. Um, is everybody familiar with that example? Yes. 
Um, so coaching and discussion. So it promotes self-directed learning. Even if the, the learning is happening in the presence of other people, it's still self-directed learning and then people can take it on further learning outside of the discussion. It's not like we're going to give you a curriculum and this is what you need. It's more like if you want to learn uh, certain subjects with great acceleration, then you come to us as coaches, you pay us, and you know, or in the case of a PhD program, you pay a big tuition and you get a lot of attention and it's very critical attention, very you know, precise attention where they're going to be looking for logical holes, they're going to be looking for how does this relate to other research in the field, uh, whatever things that, that would happen in the PhD situation, um, that would be present in any kind of coaching. There's just review. There's like a peer review. And in this case, the peers are considered, we're, we're looking for people who are considered um, authorities of some kind. So we want to find an authority or an expert or a specialist and partner with them or occasionally get their feedback. Um, I also have written in the chart natural development of intelligence. So it's not curriculum driven, it's individual driven. So when the individual is ready, they go into a new subject matter. Which subject matter do they go into? Which tangent? Whichever one they, they pick. So it's a spontaneous pace and a spontaneous sequence. Like research like innovation, like, you know, if you're doing, um, well, if you're doing engineering uh, design of, of helicopters, uh, then you need to have a back, basic background of how helicopters work, but eventually you're going to want to refine and experiment and explore, and that's a creative process. Innovation is a creative process. I do a lot of, I've done a lot of songwriting, so I will take certain foundations and then I'll put some lyrics to it, and then the lyrics will uh, um, alter the chord sequence and how I um, emphasize the different chords and, and, and the rhythms. Everything fits together in this kind of spontaneous creative innovation. And that can be how our normal learning process goes. That is organic learning, and the learning that happens in um, large student-to-teacher ratio situations is um, it's not a foundation to develop intelligence it's a foundation to develop um, un conformity uniformity um, expectations it's like um, you can you can transfer information quickly to a large number of people um, but developing wisdom or developing intelligence simply isn't a target of a lot of educational uh, programs. Or if it is a target, it's a, a relatively minor issue. Um, it's a secondary target. Comments or questions? No, I'd say that makes good sense, that, those, uh, that contrast. Okay. Um, and now the next item is media. Um, Daniel, would you be willing to read that paragraph on media loud enough that I can, I can hear you well? You know what, I have to apologize. I guess, uh, you know, it was an exciting day for him. And, no uh, problem. He, uh, he went to bed. No problem. Okay. I wasn't, yeah. I, I, I wasn't sure if he was even around. That's not an issue. Um, Shelly, you want to go next? Um, sure. Okay. Media. They tell you what set of issues should be important to you then provide you exactly two positions on those issues as the socially acceptable choices. The design of this is to promote tension, distress, dilemmas, agonizing, confusion, and of course social antagonism between competing groups of loyalists. I had forgotten that agonizing is addressed right there very explicitly. Now what, what Shelley just read is what I had written previously. I'm not presenting that as definitively accurate. It's a super oversimplification, but there is truth to it. On the contrasting side, we have study how the media operates on the right side. 
back to the left side though, this is what we notice is that the media select content to present to the public. Um, what are what are your questions or comments uh, on what Shelley read? I'm sorry, you're asking me. Um, well, since I said Shelley, it sounds like I'm asking you, but I, Shelley can respond too. Can you guys think of examples as as uh, we look at that? What are issues that the media tell us are important? Gay marriage. Okay, in a news, in the case of news, gay marriage. Even more obvious than news would be commercial advertisements and even the contents of shows. So, um, if there's a History Channel show on um, the secrets of the CIA, blah, 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 blah. Well, then that must be what's important is that people focus on the secrets of the CIA because it's on, you know, it got a 90-minute special on it. Wow. Or what's really important is um, Lexus because they have a commercial every 10 minutes for it. So that must be important. They show it over and over and over again. The new Lexus. Wow, that it's on sale too. This weekend only. Cool. So that must be important. As far as um, uh, uh, let's say political issues or cultural issues, um, Shelley's answer was right on. Um, what are other examples of, of any of what I just said? What are issues that the media present as really important that they, that they frequently reference. Well, if there's a major storm warning, they're going to run that on the bottom of the screen. They're going to interrupt the broadcast, a beep, beep, beep. This is a special emergency alert of the emergency broadcast system. There's a hurricane in your area. You need to know about it. So from that perspective, they're telling stuff that really is important, right? It's not just things that they select as important because of commercial interests. They're, they're also telling us things that are really, you know, could be important to us, practically. The weather, special news alerts, um, uh, what else? Um, oh, murder. If there's a murder, that's going to be the, one of the first things on the TV news. There is a mur oh, a war started? War is going to be first thing on the TV news. If there was a, a lawsuit about, you know, some, some corporation was sued and blah, 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 and it's, you know, we expect that the lawsuit's going to take three months before the jury's done, blah, blah, is that going to run first thing on the news? No. It might be, be, be on page seven of a newspaper. It might be in the 20 minute, 20th minute of a Sunday news uh, show, but it's not, or Rush Limbaugh might talk about it for a whole hour even, but as far as the whole news, um, you know, all of the different stations and everything, certain things like uh, murders and other, other events, missing children, you know, um, we, we want you guys to be aware that this child is missing and they're last spotted with such and such person. Some of these things are um, really, really, really like what anybody, like, this is, what we have as a media totally makes sense. All of it makes sense, but certainly the things about weather alerts and some of how they choose what news items to run first in the program, of course they choose sensational things to start the program with. Why? Because they don't want you changing channel. Like, there's nothing weird about that to me. Of course that's what they do. It's like, why do they put front page headlines of the most interesting story and not put that on page seven. Because they want us, people to buy the paper because all they can see is the top fold you know, of the newspaper and the headline. That's what people look at when they're choosing, oh, do I want to get a paper today? They want to sell papers. <laughs> one, exa one example of how the media uh, does you know, promote tension and agonizing, you know, when you talk about child abductions and stuff, you, know, you hear a lot of people, their perceptions have changed because of mass media. 
that now perceptions have changed because of mass media, that now it's much more dangerous now than it was 50 years ago, and you should watch your kids, and, and they're like hysterical about it. But in reality, I don't really think it's that much different. It's just so, um, you know, since, you know, it's so reported now. It's reported time and time again, you know, over a week or whatever, you know, depending on the, the case, I guess. But you know what I mean? Like, the, the perception is that it's more dangerous now, but really we're just more informed in yeah. some things, you yeah. know? Well, well, what about guns and gun control and gun violence at schools? If we have five cases of... Uh, of gun violence in the U.S. at schools, that could get a lot of media attention. And we might have, you know, two cases of there was a uh, a student who came to school, or you know, an adult, whatever, who some someone came to school with a weapon, and then a security guard shot shot them and injured them or killed them or whatever, and no one was. Let's say the the, the assailant, the would be assailant, was injured. No one else was, no one was killed, no one was injured. That one doesn't get a lot of news attention because nobody was killed. So the, uh, you know, the cops who um, are too aggressive and beat someone and that person, an elderly woman, and she dies, that's, that story is probably going to, you know, get news coverage that, is not going to happen when 500 times that cops do something really, you know, wonderful, you, you know, that story's not going to run first thing on the news. Of course not. It's not going to be on the news at all. So we're looking for, we have a sensationalist or a sensationalist oriented media, you know. It's like we want our six seconds fix of this story, that story, the next story. Give me stress. Give me emotion. Give me information, um, whatever. So we haven't gotten necessarily into the, the dilemmas things, but just can you get that, well, even what Daniel was saying as far as child abductions, can you get that if we repeat that issue over and over, it's going to promote tension and his, even hysteria or paranoia at least, maybe not hysteria, but paranoia in the public because they repeat that issue over and over. Your child is unsafe. Unless we pass this law, then... You have to be worried that the Mexicans are going to abduct your children and take them to da da da, and they're going to sell them and all that. Well, that is possible, and that might have happened three times in the last hundred years. But that doesn't mean that it's an important issue for us to focus on, you know, hours and hours of broadcast time. But the media might do that, and it's up to them what they focus on. To, to a great extent. Their commercial interests and their editorial choices are uh, not random and they do make sense. So we're, we're given stories that titillate us or stimulate us, overstimulate us, whatever. They want our interest quickly. They want, um, you know, alarm. They promote alarmism. Uh, and they promote alarmism about specific kinds of things. Uh, as far as exactly two positions on those issues, well, either, you know, you have, I don't know, what in the case of gun control, it doesn't make sense to me that there's like absolute, you know, is it totally, I don't know, maybe people do think, let's totally take away all guns from everybody, I don't even like hunters, we'll give guns to cops, and that's it, nobody else should have guns. Or, we won't even give guns to cops, like in Great Britain, a lot of guns, a lot of cops don't even get issued or they don't carry weapons. Um, <clears throat> so there can be extreme things of, you know, we want total freedom, take the government away from our guns, we don't even want to have to, you know, register them or whatever. Gun control is an issue where you actually have a fair amount of, as far as I know, a fair amount of a spectrum of different views, but there are issues where there's, it's really polarized. It's either this or that, nothing in between. Anything come to mind for in regard to that? I Politics. Think, yeah, but a specific political issue? Or, or you mean like a candidate, or what do you mean? Just abortion. Um, yeah. You said gun control, religion. Religion? Or, How do you mean? Well, 
Like religion in schools? Yeah. Yeah. Involving religion in, in schools and right. government. Okay. And as far as gay marriage, there are a lot of people who are basically, look, anybody should be able to marry anybody else they want, or at least that's what they say. They may not have thought about it much as far as lit taking literally what they just said, but um, they want you know, pretty much open r rules for marriage or people who want, you know, only a man and a woman can get married. You can't have, you know homosexuals getting married if they pass the following test. There's no test. It's either you're for it or you're against it. In the case of something like um, um, multiple wives, uh, which in Arizona there are, there, are, there are communities where everybody knows that there's lots of, um, what's that called? Polygamy? But it's not, it's not enforced by the government. They don't go out of their way to go and arrest those people for whatever reason. Um, it's it's officially illegal. They just don't bother with it. And uh, what if there's a rule that you know if you're you know there's a lot of these things. It's like cut and dry issues, and there's not a lot of gray area. The, I, I think of gun control as one where a lot of people would say, well, we should ban assault weapons of the following kind, and um, we also. We don't even want our, our police to have assault weapons. Maybe I don't know. There's just a there's there's more of a mixture of issues, in, as far as I know, about gun control. But there are issues that are very polarized. Um, it can lead to things where if somebody's in a family where everybody's against abortion and it's really public and they're really against abortion, and then a young lady gets pregnant, and then she doesn't want her parents to even know she's pregnant and she gets an abortion privately and there, you know, there can be a lot of tension around it um, when you have these really polarized issues and people aren't thinking of these issues as human circumstances they're thinking of them as just political issues and that they're these, these you know hugely emotionally charged things and again I'm not saying that there should be a spectrum of issues as it relates to abortion. I, I'm not taking a position on it, but I'm noting that there are things where it's very polarized and things where it's not, and I'm also noting that the media can have an influence on making something acceptable or making something unacceptable or um, presenting the idea that, you know, um, one group is attacking another group and it's so unjustified and that and that group that's been attacked has every right to retaliate and so <clears throat> like you know the terrorists who did this to us in September of 2011 we must go all over the world and destroy every country where it might have been related to that or you know control all those countries and make sure that we kill all the people who might have been involved it can be a very kind of extreme uh, reaction so you, what you get is extreme reactions, passionate reactions, even hysterical reactions. And the media can program that intensity of reaction. It can say, here's what it's okay to be outraged about. Here's the list. This, this, and this. Nothing else. Those three things. Those are the things it's okay for you to be outraged about. In fact, if you're not outraged about the first one, I think there might be something wrong with you. So, you know, we've got our list, right? Here's, the, here's your choices of things to be outraged about. You should be outraged about a few of these things. Uh, amongst the others, pick a few others. You should be outraged about something. You should be grieving about something. There's something really tragic. It's horrible. We need to change the government or we need to change the uh, culture. You know, there's all these issues. And the media is, including even movies, even songs, you know, music, rap music, metal music, pop music, dance music, all of the lyrical content and all of the ways that the, that the celebrities um, uh, are covered in the media, all the ways that the celebrities present themselves, all of that is, can be sensationalist, it can be divisive, you know, there's like the the... I don't know that you guys are familiar with this, but the East Coast rap folks against the West Coast rap folks. There really was real tension between these two different, you know, groups of, of, 
music enthusiasts, which in a lot of ways we would think they were quite similar, but they had, at certain periods of time, there was a lot of uh, animosity between those groups. Like there might be between, you know, somebody likes Metallica, and then Metallica covers, what was that one, Turn the Page song? Who's that by, Daniel? Bob Seger. Bob Seger. So Metallica covered, I love Metallica, but I also love Bob Seger, or I hate Bob Seger, and then Metallica covers Bob Seger, and now it's not cool to like Metallica anymore, and I've got to like, you know, I've got to deal with this, this shame issue, this social, <laughs> social perception issue, um, and is, is, is Shelly's brother still going to like me if I say that I do like Metallica's Bob Seger cover? Because I know it's not cool. It's not the normal Metallica thing, right? So um, that's a silly issue as far as you know, music entertainment. But the point is people are taught like what's cool. Whether it's what's cool politically, what's, what's politically correct, or what's socially cool, what's cool to wear, what nail polish should I wear, how should I do my makeup, what hairstyles are cool, what dresses are in this season... What is the right kind of shirt to wear? If you're, you know, going on a date, then you want to wear the short with the little guy riding the horse. That's called a polo. That's the cool one. You want a members-only jacket, and you want, um, you know, you want to wear your flock of seagulls concert shirt, so you can be cool. Because if you wear, um, what's that other group? Um, you know, the one that your girlfriend likes. Um, I'm trying to literally think of the name, but uh, it's, I'm drawing a blank. Um, Dan, what's, the, what's the, the, the group that your girlfriend just adores? Fall Out Boy. Fall Out Boy. So I, if I wear my Fall Out Boy t-shirt to the Justin Timberlake con concert, am I going to get beat up? Because you know how them Justin Timberlake people are. are they gonna, is that going to be okay? What if I wear my Justin Timberlake t-shirt to the Metallica concert? Am I gonna have people like throw their throw their joints at me, you know, and try and burn me with them? And can I catch I hope them so. all? Can I catch them all? And am I gonna be able to have like a three month supply just from wearing my Justin Timberlake uh, shirt because all the joints they're gonna be throwing at me? So these are the kinds of questions that uh, I'm obviously getting off on quite a tangent here. But the media sets up for us through MTV, um, through even you know um, alternative record labels like. One of the things is it gets kind of ridiculous once I start saying, like, what was uh, the old, uh, um, um, oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, Metal Blade Records, like in 1985, there was this record company, it was a pretty small company, maybe they were a division of Sony or division of Warner Brothers or whatever, but Metal Blade uh, had... Anthrax and Metallica or some other groups, maybe not those, but it had certain groups. And you have to have a record label for those things to get popular, you know, for those bands to get massive distribution. And as time went on in the music industry, people took the money to start distribution companies and start record labels. Some of, Sometimes it was an artist that was successful and then started a label to promote their own, you know, uh, people that they were uh, uh, discovering but um, when you go to a publisher and you want to have a book published the publisher wants certain kind of books and, the, and, and they're, they're going to be considering is this a book that in current markets we can be confident is worth risking money on it's the same kind of question that um, a record company executive asks. So you bring in your demo CD, and you know if you if you're Poison, you know I, I assume you are familiar with the band Poison from the '80s. So if you're Poison and you come into LA, I think they were an LA band, and you bring in your 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 demo and you've got your promotion pictures, that's going to go well. If it's 1969 and that group with that same kind of thing tries to have the same results, they're not going to have the success that Poison did. There was a group called New York Dolls, if I recall correctly, that was like David Bowie and, and certain other groups were the beginning of glam, what we would call glam, 
but they didn't have the massive quick success that Poison did. Poison picked a certain time, a certain presentation, and they got, you know, distributed. So it's not important that we're talking about these different issues. It's just the media will promote things that they think are going to sell. And also, they may promote things that they, um, you know, are going to keep people listening through the commercials. And they also may promote things that, that correspond to other interest besides just the short-term dollar interest. So in the case of Edward Bernays and diamond industry, um, I think y'all are familiar with this reference that Bernays was hired by De Beers to <coughs> promote diamonds to the American public so that the American public would stop thinking of wedding rings as something you could buy with any variety of kind of gems and they want Wedding rings are must be a diamond. We want to go from the situation in 1905 to having total dominance of the wedding ring market by diamonds within a few years or a few decades. How can we do that, Mr. Bernays? And Mr. Bernays says, I got an idea for you. What we'll do is we'll hire some uh, movie producers. We'll have some scripts written around this really romantic scene where the leading man, very handsome, Clark Gable, I think is available, and he'll give Catherine Hepburn or whoever, some beautiful blonde lady, he'll give her the ring. They'll kiss. It'll be the highlight of the movie. We'll have some great violin music in the background. And um, all of the women that watch this movie are going to be so emotionally um, you know, uh, stimulated by this scene that if we do this for 10 years, we will dominate the wedding ring market. We'll even make a movie called Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend or a movie called Diamonds Are Forever. We can make these movies and um, not only present the movies, but we'll uh, have the newspaper uh, um, photographers and the newspaper editors take pictures of the stars and the celebrities wearing these huge diamond necklaces that we only let them wear for the Academy Awards show. We don't let them keep them, but during the awards show, we let them wear them and then we'll put at the bottom... Uh, Marilyn Monroe is wearing a a dress from blah 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 and a wedding or and a, um, a a diamond necklace from blah 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 and she's wearing a diamond bracelet from blah 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 and so on like they promote these things through the media and they they do it very deliberately and Edward Bernays was the founder of the public relations industry and in addition to diamonds the other thing he's famous for is well a couple things one thing he's famous for in terms of commercial way is getting women to smoke cigarettes. So he was hired by Lucky Strikes Corporation because they weren't selling to women. And Lucky Strikes was saying, look, we have another like 50% of the public that we want buying our cigarettes. And Bernays was successful. And the way he was successful was interesting. I think I'll skip the story for now. But um, I could say more. Uh, and the other thing Bernays is famous for is he... Um, orchestrated the uh, promotion of World War I to the American public. So basically, the U.S. government and other interests in Europe said, we want the American public to support a U.S. invasion of Europe. Mr. Bernays, what can we do to make that happen? And he said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to write a bunch of false news stories, publish them in the newspapers. Maybe we'll retract them a month later, but that's not really important. We'll get these headlines and we'll get these news stories all over the place and we will spread some, some rumors about um, our, our targeted enemies, and before long, the American public is going to be in an emotional uproar saying, we demand that we go, and you know we need to send our young men, uh, borrow money from the Swiss to build more weapons and send our young men to Europe to save the uh, Europeans from the, the horrible other Europeans. And uh, he was so successful... Um, that corporations saw what he did with the government. I, I, I don't remember if he, did, if he worked for the government first and then the corporations hired him, or if he worked for the corporations first and the government said, we need you to, you know, we need you to get public opinion uh, to support our, our favorite you know, programs. But anyway, um, how familiar are you guys with Edward Bernays or anything else I just said? Very familiar, other than what you've mentioned of him. 
Yeah, so you might have heard me refer to it before. Daniel, Dan, anything? Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard you refer to it before and, and pretty much, you know, said the same thing this time, you yeah. know. Yeah. So there's a lot of interesting details about, um, you know, Bernays and about advertising and, and about the mass media. And um, I didn't intend to get that far into it right now, but I was on a little bit of a roll. So... The thing I want to note is that it's cr that the media can promote tension and antagonism between competing groups of loyalists, the Democrats versus the Republicans, or this the the pro Hillary uh, the pro Hillary Democrats versus the pro Obama Democrats or whatever. You know, the point is divide and conquer, or divide and um, distract. So. Um, we want people tuned in, we want people emotionally um, stimulated, and then we're going to pound them with Cheetos commercials and Super Bowl um, uh, beer commercials or whatever. So, you know, we're, we're presented really uh, intriguing things by the media. Tune in after the break, we're going to talk about the new murder uh, suspect that we just have breaking news about. And then you go to the break and you learn about Cheetos and you learn about, you know, um, if it's right at dinner time, then they're going to have ads about antacid drugs and acid reflux, all the different things. And then the news break comes back and what do they say? Uh, you know, they say, well, here's the thing about the, uh, um, you know, the breaking news about the murder suspect. Now, let's take 15 minutes to talk about why the drug companies are, are, really uh, out for profit and they're not really oriented towards promoting health. Does that ever happen on on 6 o'clock news? No. Will it ever happen? No, probably not. The drug companies pound those uh, that, that time, that schedule uh, on TV with ads. The, the, they, you know, their lobbying dollar is at work. Same for Pepsi. You're never going to have an expose on sodas on on the evening news. I don't. I don't think you will. On you know, ask, uh, even things like the NutraSweet and stuff. Those things, they they got some mainstream media exposure, but not a lot. Um, anything else, you guys? Want to comment on? Well, just the next part, it says study how the media operates. As an example, how they also promote tension, distress, dilemma, dilemmas, stuff like that. You know, they'll give you <coughs> imprecise, you know, the scientific uh, information with global warming and different things. They, they present these ideas, and then there's two different ways to view it. But they actually, both of them might be imprecise, but a lot of people might not even look at that. Right. But that's another way they can promote confusion, too, by just giving you – and even the you know, pharmaceutical industry and the medical – uh, you know the medical community and stuff. How um, they promote that too? They they give you just different imprecise ways to look at it, but they don't really, you know, they, they do that on purpose. Is what I'm saying. Instead of actually reporting on the news, you know, with some some precision about health. I mean, they're not going to do that. Right. Right. I I would agree. Schools aren't going to teach it because there's too much commercial influence over curriculums, and or not. You know, regular schools, maybe a graduate school program. They're going to, you know. They'll admit that the the they may admit that that the research is very you know obvious in one direction or another. But even in I don't really want to get into that because I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. But my understanding is that there's a lot of advanced science students who come out of you know master's degree programs and so forth and are and do not have the, a good foundation in science. So when they look at um, uh, arthritis, you know, you have somebody, say a medical doctor comes out of all these schools of medical training, and if, if the medical doctor doesn't have any more, you know, awareness than the, um, than the pharmaceutical TV ad that says, is your arthritis causing joint pain? If so, take Pharmacid. If the doctor just knows how to identify symptoms and then, and then prescribe uh, medications, they don't understand the background of the 
uh, physiology, the pathology of how it develops, and that may not be their job. That may not be the curriculum in school. There, there, there's a lot of uh, testing and then prescribing. That's really it's a it's a set of conventions. So that's what doctors do. That's what they're trained to do. And when it comes to insurance companies and licensing boards, they the doctors do what the insurance companies cover. So they need to know what the insurance companies cover because they're agents of a of a a massive bureaucracy. They're not there to innovate, to discover, to experiment with individual cases. They're there to run through a bunch of cases. We've got a bunch of cases. Okay, let's classify all these people. We'll do some quick tests. We'll classify them. We'll throw some medications at them. Next. Who's next? Okay, now you got arthritis. Great. You, you, your arthritis is probably causing joint pain. We're going to give you Pharmacid and come back in a month and let it, and, you know, we'll, we'll see how you're doing that. Next. Who's next? Um, oh, you have a broken leg? Cool. We'll put you in a cast and we'll give you some Pharmacid to help relieve the pain. Next. Who's next? Okay. And they go on down the line and it's like an um, assembly line. So now what I just said again is oversimplified. There are physicians who probably operate differently, but there are licensing boards that will actually dis it's not called disbar. They will um uh they will re revoke the license of a physician who does too much talk about diet or too much talk about herbs or whatever. If you know they have to, they're legally required to prescribe the medications or else they'll be you know uh, they'll lose their license that's the kind of regulations that we have um, to the best of my knowledge um, Andrew Weil is a famous um, physician in Tucson Arizona and he was on PBS a lot in the 80s and 90s do you guys know that doctor? No I do not Okay. Well, he's a natural health advocate, generally speaking, and he's into like mind-body medicine and uh, things like stress reduction and how humor is so valuable in promoting recovery and health and preventing disease and uh, meditation and how it can be used to improve people's health. So he, he studied a lot of things that nowadays a lot of people think of as not at all controversial, but the FCC shut him down in regard to some of his pronouncements. They said, you've got to take that off your website. You can't put it in your books. You've got to stop saying that. He was censored, not even by a medical uh, organization, but by the Federal Communications, uh, or maybe it's Federal Trade Commission. I think it was FTC, Federal Trade Commission. And, you know, they basically said, you can't make those claims. Um, on behalf of the FDA and whatever other interests, you can't say that. You can't publish it. You can't teach it in class. It's not part of our religion. <clears throat> um, so I, we, we jumped into the subject of medicine. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, I want to go ahead and I, I, I'd like to get through this whole thing. And I think if we just blow through it, it'll take like 10 or 15 minutes. I can't imagine it taking that little if we actually comment on it, but um, where are you guys at as far as time? Do you want to blow through it? Do you want to stop? Uh, what do you think? We can blow through it. Okay. Yeah, we can blow through it. All right, so courts. Um, we were talking about, you know, licensure boards that's related to courts, of course. So courts regulate the behaviors of coercion, fraud, theft, assassinations, rituals of human sacrifice, um, etc., to protect their monopoly on those methods. So they authorize or license specific acts of coercion, and they call them taxation. Unauthorized acts of coercion are called extortion, extortion and could be criminalized and could result in punishment. But an uh, authorized act of, extor of coercion or extortion could be called taxation. Um, Obviously, we talked about Santa initially, so fraud and deception and lying are completely legal, except in certain cases. In a, in a, while giving testimony in a court case, perjury is illegal. In a contract, certain kinds of fraud will be criminal, right? But in general, 
for the government to say, um, we invaded blah, blah, blah country because we sincerely believe that blah, 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 is that illegal? Is that going to result in a court case? Is somebody going to lose their job? No, that's how they keep their job. They are a system of fraud, coercion, theft, assassination, rituals of human sacrifice, and so on. This is a little more controversial, maybe, than some of what we said before, but I don't think of it as controversial in terms of the fact of it. It's just, like, potentially... Um, people might find it, you know, scary, or they might want to argue this point, but um, I don't think of it as controversial. Comments or questions? Yeah, I think it could emotionally trigger some people, uh, th those ideas. I don't think most people could even, not most, I think some people can't even fathom, you know, those ideas, those ideas right there, or they don't, you know what I mean? So I, I can see what you mean by that. Yeah, and people, we're trained to be scared of our, lo our local systems of coercion, and it's intelligent that we be scared of the local systems of coercion. Why? Because they have a lot more... Uh, military power than I do. They have helicopters where I live. I don't know if you guys have, you know, local police have helicopters where you live, but where I live, they have helicopters. Do they have guns? I don't know. They have SWAT teams? I'm sure there are SWAT teams in the area where I live, somewhere around here. I, I don't think I've ever seen one. But I have seen the um, Department of Homeland Security guys, and they, uh, they, are, they, they look like they're, you know, um, more militarized than than the average cop. Oh come on, Jr. We've seen your guns, man. Seriously, you can take them. Like do like like Neo, you know, from the Matrix. I can see you doing that. You think I can take them on? <laughs> no, it's a good point that you should be afraid. I, I I get what you're saying. I mean cautious. I don't mean like you should be terrified. But well, um, right. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cautious. Yes, yeah. that's intelligent. Yeah. 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 So it's intelligent to be cautious. You don't cuss out cops, uh, you know, in general. Like, or if you do, very, again, delicately, <laughs> deliberately, you know, make, make sure that, they're, that they really don't care and they're in a rush to deal with something else if you're going to cuss them out, you know. Um, but uh, why even do that, you know? I mean, the whole point of that, for most people, you cuss out cops to impress your friends. Well, what if you don't, you know, what if you don't, need to impress your friends. Um, so, uh, the idea that governments are violent, I don't think is controversial. The idea that governments might use propaganda or fraud, again, I don't think is controversial, especially if we think specifically of militaries. We can think of undercover police officers. That is deception. You can't be an undercover cop in an undercover car and then pull somebody over and go, ah, you know, well, I mean, you might even say it's not deception. They didn't say, I'm not a cop. But what about an undercover officer who does say, I'm not a cop, and infiltrates some organization? Obviously, there's specific, you know, clear, direct, explicit acts of deception. And that's what spies do. That's what, you know, police interrogators sometimes lie. Uh, cops can lie at a traffic stop, you know, just... L you hire lawyers to lie for you or whatever, like, I'm not looking at these things as really controversial. At the same time, I am aware that some of the terminology I'm using is going to have to be, you know, I don't think it's necessarily sensationalist, but some of it, when I say rituals of human sacrifice, that's a little bit sensationalist maybe, but it's also very precise. I literally mean that. It's not a uh, exaggeration. I literally mean court systems perform rituals of human sacrifice. In fact, the entire court process is full of ritual. Um, and a lot of the rituals are based on canon law from um, the Inquisition and the Holy Roman Empire. That's a different issue. But on to the second stage on the right there, if you're still with our chart, study how imperialist religions operate. If we study the history of legal systems, we can find a lot of really interesting things that I am going to completely skip for now. So, imperialist religions, what I mean by that is governments. Um, why am I calling that a religion? I'm going to skip that for now. Um, I already made the reference earlier about medical school issues or whatever, licensing issues, when a, when a doctor says, um, 
it's our religion, well doctors don't say this, but when I say it's a doctor's religion to prescribe medications and not to, to talk about herbs or not to talk about electrons or not to talk about acidity, their, their religion changes, but they have a very prescribed um, uh, set of dogmas or doctrines. That's what they promote to the public. And if they say cancer is incurable and arthritis is incurable, and it's you know genetically you're genetically predisposed to arthritis, that's a religion in a general sense of the word religion. It's not scientific to say arthritis is is a genetic disease. That's a, one of the big issues with how science is presented, and especially medical science, is correlation and causality are not um, explicitly distinguished in so many of the mainstream media and mainstream school presentations about science, so about medical science. So we'll say cholesterol causes blah, 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 when all we have really is some correlations. And I've already talked about how that was promoted by the margarine industry and so on. We'll skip it. Uh, we'll, we'll leave our references brief unless somebody's dying to put something in on that. Uh, anything else before we proceed to the next section? <coughs> Shelley, would you read the medicine uh, block? Yes. Medicine. Efficient systems for categorizing organisms as diseased identifying a variety of symptoms, then efficiently suppressing the immune system of the herd so that the human resources can promptly return to the battlefield, the factories, and the plantation fields. Okay, so does that, is there anything unclear about how I presented that? No. So, efficiently suppressing the immune system, there are symptoms, we want to stop them. Cough, suppressant. Uh, you're vomiting, we'll stop it. You have a rash, we'll stop it. Why? Because we want you back at work. We want you back on the battlefield. We want you back in school. Or maybe, I don't know, they might not. I'm not sure. E even like little kids and students at like an elementary school or whatever. I mean, if my mom wanted me back in school instead of to stay home with me a day when I'm sick, well, that, it makes sense. Because she had a job. And for her to take a day off on short notice, a few days off, it's interrupting her her workload, her you know what she has to do on her desk, her stuff that she's being counted on. And if she does it too much, then she could lose her job, you know. So, one of the things that's a huge cultural transition that people don't often refer to, but it's really obvious, is um, the uh, presence of women in the workplace has risen incredibly in the last few decades in the U.S. Generally speaking, people will report that as a wonderful thing, and it certainly has been good for the economy in the sense of having a huge number of people enter the workforce and be participating in um, economic productivity. Um, it has also uh, meant that a lot of children uh, did not get as much, um, well, I was a latchkey child a lot of my youth, and I know a lot of people are. Latchkey meaning I had my own key to let myself in when I got home because no one else was there. My, my mom wasn't there, my older sister got out of school later than I did, so I would be home unsupervised by myself. And uh, that was in middle school, I think, that was when that happened, so it wasn't like I was in elementary school. but. Um, We don't need to talk about this right now, but it is just a fact that in a lot of countries, um, the presence of women in the home has diminished considerably in terms of housewives and, and much more involvement in workplaces. Um, we do have some counter trends where now it's really popular um, amongst relatively wealthy people for them to have offices at home. So they want to have an office in their house and telecommute. I know I know a number of people who do that, but um, they might you know they might be relatively small percentage of people. But that's for some people. There's that counter trend that's attractive where they want 
to have a home office, or at least they want a home office in their fantasy, and then when they get it, they might find that it's really, <laughs> um, you know, very distracting to have your children around at your home office, and you want to move it into your garage or a little further away from all the noise, you know. Um, anyway, um, nothing wrong. So this is another thing. People tend to think if I say that the United States is a organization that has religious elements and commits fraud and violence and rituals of human sacrifice and assassinations and theft, basically, or, or takes things from, from people in other parts of the world and people within the United States by force. Um, some people might think, oh, and I'm condemning the U.S.? Oh, and I'm saying that people should feel guilty because they contribute tax money to the U.S.? That's, that's not what I said at all. And that's a natural response that people would have, which, you know, might be why they, um, uh, you know, we're told by the media that governments over there are corrupt and we should go rescue those people from corruption. Implicitly, it is we don't have corruption within our system. We never did. Not 100 years ago, not 20 years ago, not 300 years ago. We've never had corruption. We are innocent and angelic and saintly, generally speaking. And our media-identified target is needing our rescue. Those people need to be rescued by us. We need to send them military aid. We need to send troops. We need to send, I don't know what. We need to send, you know, um, we need to send our, our diplomat to tell them with, you know, great emotional sentimentality, we love you guys, but we're going to have to just, you know, uh, reduce our trade with you if you don't treat your... Um, uh, your elderly better. <clears throat> so courts regulate the behaviors of coercion, fraud, theft, assassination, rituals of human sacrifice, and so on to protect their monopoly on those methods through licensing. We can, in contrast, we can study how imperialist religions operate rather than um, you know, argue about courts doing those things. We don't need to defend that some uh, gov coercive governments are justified in their coercion. They're all coercive. They all have their own pro propaganda to justify themselves. We don't have to get caught up in any of that. Um, we can just study how they operate, including how they, you know, do propaganda and all that. I'm ready to move on. Anything else? Oh, I see that I'm back on the wrong subject. Um, so, we already, Shelley already, already read about medicine. So, Daniel, you want to read the, the one to the right? Study the science of? I'm going to continue that one. Yes, study the science of promoting health in particular and occasionally explore briefly the history of the medical industry, how it profits, plus how it promotes hysteria and chronic illness. Compare the relative effectiveness of vet, veterinarians with the ab abysmal results of the oath sworn priests of medical demon worship. Through the inattentive use of language, mainstream medicine promotes the hysterical worship of di diagnostic labels like cancer, as if it is living at a fit, I'm sorry, as if it is a living entity that attacks an organism, possesses it, grows, and then kills it. Thank you for adding the word a there where I, where I didn't. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's, why I, that's why I stumbled. Thank you for that. <laughs> that was a test, and you passed. Um, so we, I don't think we've really talked about veterinarians versus, um, and, and their approach and their results versus um, mainstream MDs, but that's a subject that people could research. And if you, you know, if you have pets or something, you may notice that, that, uh, there are some differences in how, you know, similar conditions will be treated. Not necessarily wonderful, you know, it's interesting how much money people put into, uh, into, um, pets. 
where I'm really talking about the difference between veterinary medicine and regular medicine isn't in regard to pets because with pets some veterinarians will really um, uh, pull the emotional strings of the pet owner and get them to invest in, in massively expensive and really ineffective things. But in the case of livestock veterinary medicine, that's really what I, what I meant. In livestock veterinary medicine, they assess the creature. If it's a one-year-old horse and we expect it to live for you know, a few years, and it's a one-year-old horse, we look very quickly, we want to assess, it's not just like get it back in the fields and you know, in the factory and all that, but we want to assess the, the animal and the organism really closely. And if it's a, depending on the value we associate with that creature, like we don't care about a chicken, but if it's a, an 800-pound cow, 800-pound um, um, pig or a, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of heritage pig, but like these, there's really expensive, really prized pigs, pri you know, certain horses, like a racehorse. If you look at livestock veterinary medicine and then ra racehorse veterinary medicine, as well as even how athletes get handled in uh, medicine, you can see not only that you have that issue of a balance between short-term remedies and long-term results, like in a livestock creature, you know, they want, or, or in a workhorse, let's go with a workhorse. So it's not a racehorse, it's a workhorse. They want long-term health for the workhorse. How can we change the diet? How can we do a couple simple things? What, you know, there's little, um, there's small things, small amounts of money, small things to go a long way. There is a different orientation in veterinary medicine, uh, than you'd find in regular MD situations. And then as it relates to sports medicine with like athletes, um, there are, uh, my friend Carl is really into these patches that um, promote athletic performance and promote health in general. And the World Cup team of Germany, which won the World Cup, uh, wore these patches. Uh, I don't know if any other teams in the World Cup did, but I know that Germany did. And um, other athletes, you know, people who are interested in performance, they're not just interested in preventing disease, they're interested in high performance. There are um, similarities between, vet you know, how veterinary medicine is operated, you know, like, I'm not saying this very clearly, but the way that a physician, a veterinary, the way that a vet thinks about certain animals is more like how certain trainers think about their athletes um, or how certain holistic medical practitioners think about their their patients so we do see some contrasts um, including uh, you know simple tests um, nutrition nutrition's been huge in veterinary medicine for a long time it's it's also in um, horticulture when you have you bring in some specialist to say, why aren't my plants yielding? They don't have time, you know, they don't have the time and money to worry about certain issues. They go in, they either want to eliminate the pests and, you know, have this kind of short-term yield orientation, or they're interested in long-term soil health. That's it. And the people who are interested in long-term soil health and long-term yield and lots of nu nutrients in the, in the produce, they get radically different results. So they do exist. The documentation's there. It's not as emotionally, um, you know, interesting. But um, you guys are aware that I have some special water um, <clears throat> that my wife and I use daily. I took a picture of three roses a few weeks ago, and then about a week after that, I took a picture of the roses again. I put uh, two of the roses in regular water and one of the roses in um, that other water. Would you guys be interested in seeing the, 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 the before and after pictures? Yes. Yes. Why? Curiosity. Plants don't lie. If, yeah. if, if the one plant is clearly much better hydrated, or the one stem is clearly much better hydrated than the others, then, you know, 
it's not a, we, we think, well, that's probably not a panacea or a placebo. It's not because one of the roses, you know, thought that my lab coat was really impressive and they had a lot of confidence in me. Um, it is possible for the human consciousness to influence which, which plant, you know, thrived. That's possible. But what I did is a pretty simple demonstration of the superior hydrating capacity of the water that uh, I've been drinking lately. And uh, I don't have the images. They're actually in my phone. I'm not going to put them in front of you right now, but I'll, I'll share them with you later. Uh, I, I, can, I can even share them with them later tonight. Um, so some people are interested in innovation. Other people are interested in categorizing the, the human resources and managing them, getting them back on the battlefield or saying, oh, this one isn't, we don't want them back on the battlefield. Let's send them back home to the United States and we're going to, you know, give them a, a, a discharge for medical injury or whatever and we'll give them a Purple Heart medal and, you know, uh, we'll give them disability. I don't know what. So it's a sorting process. So the main thing that medical doctors are doing is they're sorting human resources and then they're feeding them uh, certain kinds of interventions, medications of a pharmaceutical sort being the primary uh, substance, whether it's a, a public school or a, uh, a, a, a military situation. If you go to the, to the military doctor and you say, I'm, I'm injured in the following way, they're going to say, okay, here's the medication for you, right? They're going to give you, they're going to give a, a, a military veteran a, a you know, pills. I meant to say a soldier. So the military, or even a VA hospital though, if you think about a Veterans Affairs hospital, they're going to do um, a certain kind of systematic medicine. It's very systematic. It is not person-oriented. It's not holistic. And you wouldn't expect it to be. If you really think about it, it's an institutional uh, service. It's like Insurance companies, they're institutional. They're never going to get into holistic medicine uh, in, a, in a really personalized, customized way. They're never going to replace an individual um, you know, doctor with 30 years of experience. Insurance companies aren't physicians. They might hire some, but you know, we can contrast these really radically different models of relating to health, relating to uh, symptoms. Um, it's not a surprise that the FTC would jump all over an MD like, what's his name, Andrew Weil for um, suggesting that people focus on nutrition more or even saying something like, you know what, if you cut down your consumption of carbohydrates and increase your consumption of fat, you're likely to dramatically lose, you know, if you're obese, you're likely to, to lose weight and quickly and healthy, you know, and be healthy because you cut down on carbs and you increase your fat because, so that you can, you know, um, have your body uh, in hormonal balance. The idea that eating a lot of carbohydrates or certain kind of carbohydrates um, throws a human organism into a serious hormonal imbalance, that's not going to be on your fourth grade test anytime soon that I'm aware of. Even though Sweden changed their rules, I don't expect the U.S. to. Small countries have much more responsiveness. Um, here's a weird little detail. So Napoleon was famous as a military leader because he had little groups of cavalry um, squads. I don't know if squads is the right word, but you know, small troops. And they could be very responsive in quick amounts of time. They were very fast because they were on horseback. <coughs> and, <coughs> and most of his competition within Europe at the time was infantry-based troops who marched in formation and they marched in and they liked to fight in open fields. And he liked to use the woods and um, small skirmishes, little like, what's that called? Attrition, where he would kill small amounts at a time. They would catch people by surprise. They didn't come into open combat with 40,000 infantry against 40,000 infantry. That's not how Napoleon operated and perhaps because he he didn't have the resources to do that. He had to innovate and he was he was very successful as a military leader because he had small pockets of relatively decentralized um, uh, communication. He had 
uh, fast channels of communication. I don't know if he had great secret codes or whatever, but I think he also decentralized some of the um, decision making so that the uh, lower ranking um, officers could choose when to go and to engage and when to leave and, and they just had a much more efficient machine compared to a really clunky machine of a lot of the other competing uh, uh, armies. I'm guessing neither of y'all have ever heard of that, is that right? That's right. Dan? That's a good guess. Yeah. Well, um, so the same thing can apply to businesses. In the modern situation, we have a lot of big institutions, really big businesses, including hospitals and you know governments that are huge, socialist governments that are huge. Uh, Sweden isn't small, but it's a lot smaller than the U.S. So they were able to review certain policies and update certain policies very quickly relative to a, pretty much any other country. There was a surge of interest by um, the uh, public in Sweden. The uh, commercial lobbying interests that opposed a healthy diet, so to speak, were unable to uh, maintain their hold on the government of Sweden. And uh, so an innovation happened there. Um, small businesses can respond quickly to chaotic, unstable, volatile situations. Huge bureaucracies typically are not good at responding to um, unfamiliar, uh, rapidly changing situations. Does that make sense? Yes. And when you take FEMA or, or certain U.S. government agencies, smaller agencies might be better at organizing, you know, emergency response than uh, the police department or the Department of Justice or something like that. It actually makes sense that there would be some smaller agencies maybe, but um, <clears throat> on the whole, what I'm suggesting as a, as a little note is that as economic and financial uh, turbulence increases, or as political turbulence increases, some smaller nations may have tremendous success and some of the bigger nations may tend to decentralize. So the EU, I've expected since I think maybe 2003 or 4 when I first studied these issues, I've expected the European Union to eventually disintegrate or dissolve because of not only my anticipation of certain economic uh, challenges, but the fact that you've got like 60 different or uh, you got a lot of different languages in the EU and it's just a huge bureaucratic challenge to deal with translations of all those different languages so um, responsiveness is an issue in certain conditions in stable long smooth trends we tend to see huge bureaucracies form and be very successful. Huge multinational companies, huge governments and empires. When you have turbulent times, uh, it's possible for small groups to respond much more quickly with much less bureaucratic uh, resistance. And uh, when it comes to smaller governments and smaller political units, the same thing is true. They can have tremendous uh, increase in power in a short amount of time in turbulent times for the smaller, more responsive uh, parties, even. A political party that's small and willing to adapt and not as established, they might be more willing to innovate and they might have a sudden increase in prominence um, because of uh, turbulent times and the other you know, major established parties just aren't as responsive uh, or aren't as progressive. We've got one more, no, we've got two more categories. I'm, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> um, let's see, I'll, I'll, I'll read next. So, uh, below the medicine one is the next one about time and finances. I was just referring to this. We're, the mainstream is programmed to organize time and finances in ways that promote public loyalty to the herd. They promote the... the overall benefit of the herd and everybody doing the same thing. Um, so we're programmed to organize our time 
and our finances in ways that pu promote public loyalty to the herd while crippling the long-term power of the entire herd. We're crippling the responsiveness by having uniformity, conformity, um, rigidity, um, the herd mentality, uh, really unexamined presumptions, uh, fanaticism, fundamentalism. We don't necessarily think of fanaticism as it relates to finances, but um, consider that that the same kind of things about religious fanatics you can find people who are uh, political fanatics, religious fanatics, or who are fanatics as it relates to investment markets and the economy and how they manage their time and just really anything. Um, any question or comment on that? So the contrasting um, box there is a bit long. Uh, what is the stage two content on um, time and finances? Who wants to read that? I can continue. <coughs> Unless somebody wants to read. Okay, study a few competing time management systems. So if I've got a certain way that I'm used to, to organizing my time, even if it's very unsystematic, at stage two, maybe after I've handled some higher priorities, I might get interested in time management. Or maybe that's a pretty high priority. So I could study a few competing time management systems. I put some time into assessing what are a few different systems. How, what are the results of those systems? Uh, how how uh, uh, easy would it be for me to implement those systems? How attractive is it for me to implement them? What kind of results uh, do I value? So I've got to actually make some assessments. I've got to think like an engineer. Um, not think like, a, I don't know, like I'm going to be tested at public school of what's the right way to manage your time. This is not what's the right, the one right way to manage time. This is now... I want to assess a few different systems for what appeals to me, what fits me. I can study how economic systems work in general or a particular system. I can study how politics and economics are related, how propaganda is an issue, how marketing is an issue. Um, I can study how markets efficiently redistribute wealth. Markets redistribute wealth. Some of them, some of some of the markets are pretty efficient. What does it mean to efficiently redistribute wealth as distinct from inefficiently? We don't need to get into that now, but we do know that markets redistribute wealth. Are you all both clear that markets redistribute wealth? Do you know what I mean by that and you're clear about it? Yes? Yes. Yes? Yes. Um, we can study why economic trends form and why they reverse. How do they reverse? You know, what patterns show up? What, what are the sequences of events? We can get interested in that at some point. We can study emerging economic realities, like what's currently present, to accurately measure opportunity and risk that are emerging, that are present. That's what's actually happening now. Not our presumptions, not what happened in the 90s, not what worked well in the 80s. What is happening now? What is the best strategy now? What's the reality now? And that, need, that involves ongoing assessments. I was talking about the smaller... Uh, military general being more responsive or the smaller organization, the smaller network being more responsive. Why? Because they can be more attentive. They don't necessarily have the complacency that can develop in a huge successful bureaucracy. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so somebody who's not super wealthy is not likely to be complacent. Somebody who's super wealthy, Warren Buffett, lost tens of millions of dollars in recent years. Why? Because it didn't, it's like he was, he still had a lot more left. He just, his motivation level and the motivation level of the people he hired could have been pretty low. Once you've got 600, you know, million dollars, another million may not seem like that big a deal. Or once you've got 14 billion dollars, another billion might not seem like that big of a deal. But if you've got $7,000, another $7,000 might seem like a big deal. Um, 
So we can study the emerging economic realities to accurately measure opportunity and risk and then take strategic, systematic action to benefit consistently from emerging changes. We want lots of little benefits over long periods of time to compound uh, consistent and, and um, favorable results. So we don't want to have long-term buy and hold. We don't want to wait till we've lost 36% to consider, wait a minute, should I change my strategy? Um, or to consider, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. But, you know, you guys may know that in real estate markets and in uh, uh, stock markets, people who might have had a $1,000 down payment or a $100,000 down payment on real estate, if their real estate dropped uh, in value by $36,000, then that means their, their equity in the real estate dropped 36%. They lost thirty-six thousand dollars. They put down a hundred thousand, and then only sixty-four thousand were left. They lost thirty-six percent. They could lose all of that, and they still have a mortgage on top of that that they could lose. If, if in some cases, they might have put a hundred thousand dollars down and four hundred thousand dollars borrowed or something. So, um, people can be attentive to risk. They can be interested in profit. They can be interested in safety and security. Uh, their cash flow, there's all sorts of things that people can, you know, in some cases people will get less interested in paying off their debts and less interested in their credit record and more interested in having cash available and having good cash flow. They just don't care about their credit uh, record or their credit report when they have, you know, when nobody's going to, once they hit a point where nobody's, they expect that nobody's going to lend to them or they don't even want to borrow more, then they're going to get really interested in their cash flow. They're going to get really interested in their profits. They're not going to be interested in their credit score as much. Or it won't be a priority. Even if they want to keep it good, their preference might be, I want to keep it good. But it just wouldn't necessarily be a priority that it would be when they're thinking, I want to buy a home. And I want to buy five, borrow $500,000 before I buy the home or to buy the home. Well, then they're going to be interested in their credit score. It makes sense. They're going to, they're going to you know... Um, operate in ways that make their credit score look good. Other people uh, uh, will be really interested in cash flow or they'll be really interested in uh, uh, not getting evicted. You know, they'll file bankruptcy to um, put a stay or a delay on their foreclosure of their home. So you have all these different kinds of situations that businesses and households can get into in uh, certain periods of time, um, there was a much a, a rapid increase in the rate of foreclosures in the United States um, as people were, for whatever reason, not paying their mortgages and then mortgage companies uh, had to deal with this huge decrease in cash flow. So the mortgage companies like Countrywide, uh, Lots and lots of uh, Washington Mutual, lots and lots of financial institutions themselves went bankrupt. Why? Because their cash flow collapsed. Um, the city of Detroit went bankrupt, I believe. Not sure if they went bankrupt. I think they did. Um, why? Their cash flow fell so far down that they couldn't even cover their debts. So governments have that happen. Households have that happen. Uh, Businesses have that happen, and then at other times, you know, you'll have uh, people who get really interested in their credit scores again. It goes in cycles. <coughs> um, so, uh, back to reading. The stage two person can use the relative legal systems deliberately, like the court systems, to promote maximum asset protection and mass maximum sheltering. Um, something like filing bankruptcy um, or filing a lawsuit, you know, there's just the issue is most people don't think about uh, using the court system for protection. They don't think about, in most cases, how do I um, set up my finances so that I dramatically reduce my tax liability. When there's a, a massive sense of economic growth and boom. People don't get as interested in reducing tax liability. But when, uh, when they can, you know, when it's a really hard for them 
to pay their taxes and for them to, you know, like when money's tight, guess what? They'd be happy to spend $1,000 for a tax attorney to save them $4,000 this year. They're really interested in that all of a sudden. Why weren't they interested before? I don't really know why, but they weren't. You know, if they, they didn't even think about it. They just paid the $4,000. They didn't consult a tax attorney to save money. Um, why do corporations spend, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars on tax attorneys? So they can save millions of dollars on taxes, which they have. If you look at the U.S., this is, God, I go on all these tangents. So, um, I read recently that what's changed massively in the U.S. in the last few decades is that corporations went from paying 33% of the total uh, tax revenues to the U.S. to down to 9%. So you have, you have record corporate profits on the whole in the U.S., but some of the lowest uh, proportion of, of federal government revenues coming from corporations. How did that happen? Well, over time, slowly, you know, but um, it is kind of an interesting thing. And uh, corporations have been interested in reducing their taxes. They've lobbied and they've uh, hired their tax attorneys and they've used the loopholes. They've created the loopholes. The middle class is generally asleep or dreaming the American dream, and in their complacency, uh, they take certain obvious uh, steps to reduce their taxes, but um, the idea of, of researching ways to reduce your taxes, you know, if you make $200,000 a year, do people in general go out of their way to to consult with the tax attorney. I think in general people go to attorneys after the crap hits the fan. They don't go to attorneys, you know, middle class people don't think of attorneys as somebody to put on retainer, somebody to hire to help things go smoothly. But there are times, there are groups of people and there are times when um, People relate to attorneys kind of like they relate to dentists. We're going to go see the, the attorney occasionally just to run over, you know, go over how things are going. That may be a shocking comment, but there are, but there are businesses and there are industries that do that. And everybody knows that. The average household, I don't think that they, in, you know, in current times, I don't think they do that. But other periods of time, other places, um, Lawyers didn't have the, the same, you know, kind of a reputation as an industry that they do now. We have tons of lawyers in the U.S., just like we have tons of MDs, but we don't use those lawyers um, like the average person doesn't have a lawyer. Um, a lot of the legal profession is... Um, corporate law because that's who's paying and that's who's hiring and uh, they're really interested you know was it um, personal injury lawsuits and you know wherever the money is if you got big uh, settlements that's where the lawyers go where's the money they're in it for business and if nobody's going to pay them you know, if you're not, you know, I, I, I work for a law firm and he had a, um, there was a, a car dealership up where I lived that put every local attorney on retainer. You guys know why? So that people, people couldn't sue for their car? Yeah. So if, if they have every local attorney on, on retainer, then you can't hire a local attorney to sue that company because none of the lawyers that are on retainer from that company uh, you know, can, can sue the company that they're on retainer with. So they just they hired every attorney in the local area. And did they screw a lot of people? Well, I can't say for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you guess. But... Um, they were, pro you know, did they make a lot of profits? Uh, you know, another issue. So, the, there are businesses that think 
as weird as that example may be, there are businesses that think very deliberately about the court system. And part of it may be that they they got really slammed. You know, maybe one of those car dealerships got really nailed in a couple lawsuits and they realized, wow, we need to do something different. And so they did. And I think it went well for them. I don't, I don't know, really. But... Um, so we've got these last two items. Anybody want to read the bottom left? Avoid, Avoid the subject of mortality by conjuring... Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Please continue, Dan. Avoid the subject of mortality by conjuring... By conjuring a soothing story of an heavenly afterlife to comfort the immature when someone dies, and promotes a, par a paranoia about avoiding the eternal tortures of hell, so as to promote blind conformity. Train to operate in ways so that your productivity supports the government, church, probate, attorneys, etc. Do you know what a probate attorney is, Dan? Uh, that's the attorney, like, if someone dies, their estate or their assets go into probate. Um, so, it's, they help to sort out, like, okay. when people die, where the money goes. Um, so, avoids the subject of mortality by conceiving of a afterlife and an eternal life, etc., um, which may be... Uh, poetic, maybe imprecise, maybe unscientific, maybe presumptive, and it may be an excellent story for um, soothing the uh, the grieving six-year-old. So grandma dies, and I say, don't cry, or don't cry right now, because we're in the library, but just think about how wonderful it's going to be when you get to reunite with grandma when you die because uh, she'll be in heaven waiting for you and she'll give you a big hug. Won't that be awesome? Won't you like that? And so we can use these stories to interrupt the uh, emotional upsets of the naive. <coughs> um, also, it can be very useful to uh, suggest to people that if they uh, don't uh, support the Roman Catholic Church, that we're going to uh, have the Inquisition come over to your house, arrest you, and torture you until you agree. So you might as well agree in advance. Or, uh, if that's not good enough, uh, we'll say that not only are you subject to tortures in this life, but you'll have eternal tortures in hell if you don't um, you know, agree that there's only one way to salvation. And so they're promoting a emotional reaction and they're promoting um, conformity. You could say they're promoting paranoia. Uh, you want to get to heaven and you need to be a good boy or good girl or a good worker or a good taxpayer to, or a good uh, church, uh, what do you call it? A good, good church member? What? Church a good church goer. Um, you got to go every week too. You know, you need to go to church every week. You need to do the right things. You need to pay their tithes and so on. And then You'll get to escape from hell, and when you die, you will get rewarded with whatever rewards. You'll get, you know, I, I wrote this on Facebook today. If you're a good boy, then you'll get five bags of Halloween candy when you die. So, five bags. Or, um, well, I get to see my grandma. Will you get grandma? to see your, your grandma? Yeah. Well, um, I, if she was good, if she went to heaven, then yes. Was she a good person? She's kind of like me, so you be the judge. So. <laughs> Does she like Halloween candy? No, she's opposed to it because she heard that one time there was razor blades in some of it, so... Oh, well, you know, an I, urban I'm legend, not, I think, but yeah, she was definitely. 
what, this, just so you know, they have gluten-free, sugar-free Halloween candy in heaven. So, you know, if you have a dietary consideration, uh, or if your grandma does, um, that will be, you know, addressed. It's five bags, so there's going to be a lot of different kinds of candy in there. So, don't worry. Um, let's see. So, the, I'm not really giving the history here, but you guys have heard me refer to it before. I'm, I'm suggesting that there is a, uh, a direct lineage between the prophet Noah and his, uh, um, the new religious innovations that he did and modern governments. And I don't see it as at all controversial. Once again, not only did, uh, you know, for one thing, um, President George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, um, signed an executive order in the early 90s, um, recognizing that the U.S. government system is derivative from the the uh, the Noahide commandments, the 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 seven commandments of Noah. Um, the first six were the were the commandments that the Hebrews would follow uh, based on Adam's expulsion from the garden, Adam and Eve's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Um, the seventh commandment was that Noah was the first Hebrew prophet who had the right to enforce the other six commandments on all the rest of humanity, whether they wanted it or not. So it was a new innovation in um, governing and in propaganda. Because if the, if the rest of... If the Hebrew tribes didn't rule over all of the rest of the humans, then God was going to punish all of humanity by killing them with another apocalypse, even worse than the flood. That was what the pop. That is what the popular story of of Noah uh, says. If somebody actually you know reads all of it. Um, so, in contrast to the stage one ideas that I just mentioned about heaven and uh, being reborn as a um, as a turtle if you're if you're slow or whatever all of the ideas of karma they're all basically extensions of the same idea so um, I don't I don't think of those as things that need to be literal to be valuable if they are literal fine if somebody wants to argue that they're literal okay I think that they're very functional even if they're not literally true. So that's my position, is that whether or not they're literally true, they're socially functional, just as modes of influence. Um, so rather than avoiding the subject of mortality, the stage two orientation, Daniel, would you conclude for us? Read the bottom right, please. Cherish, cherish life. Yes. Cherish life, respect death, leave a legacy for kin. Okay, so cherish life because it is fragile. Respect death because it can come at any time and it's a pretty big deal. And if you haven't had, you know, a reminder from Robin Williams or whatever, then, uh, you know, you might get a reminder in the future. Just, you know, animals die, humans die. We have that situation. So it's valuable to respect the issue of death, to cherish life because it is something that can suddenly change from hurricanes to bombs to suicides. I guess suicide's not a great example, but things that are outside of our control can alter our lives. Or someone else that we, you know, that we might think if our, if our coworker, you know, commits suicide and we were like, oh my God, I had no idea that was going to happen, but it can happen and it can affect us. It can result in grief and emotional um, uh, disturbance. Like, I don't mean disturbance in a bad way. I mean, like, we'll be in a, in a, in a bit of turmoil. Well, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to reorganize our, our focus, and, and maybe we cherish life a little bit more because uh, somebody got in a car wreck. Or, or I, I've got in a wreck where I thought, wow, I was like um, 14 inches from dying. If that semi would have been 14 inches over there, or my car there, see, that would have been a different thing. But I missed. There was a, there was a near collision, but that was a, a miss. So when we have a collision, if we're driving a car, don't we, uh, don't we drive more safely, at least for a few days? <laughs> or we don't drive at all for a few days? <laughs> Can you guys relate to that? 
So leave a legacy for Ken. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I was looking for deer. Uh, I, I just, Go ahead. I'm sorry, but I was still looking for deer. You know, for I, I probably still am looking for deer uh, every time I drive home on the parkway now because I almost hit that one. So I can relate. Oh yeah, so you so you want to be more attentive so that you don't run into a deer as you're driving, right? Yeah, I hit an elk once, and uh, elks are big. Yeah. <clears throat> I uh, I didn't hit it straight on. I I, I hit it. It's uh, it was like almost had already gotten by my car, so I just glanced its flank and it kept running. It actually didn't even get knocked over. It kept running, and I I saw it from away. I have my I'm pretty sure I had my high beams on. There was a whole herd of elk, so I was able to see them pretty quick. I hit my brakes and you know was able to slow down so much that I only tap. I, I didn't just tap the elk, but I didn't hit it hard, and it kept running. It didn't even knock it down and. Uh, I was shook up. I drove differently. Uh, you know, for a few days. All right. So, um, leave a legacy for Ken is in contrast to leaving the, you know, assets for the government and the lawyers and the churches and so on. You know, I mean like big churches to take. If you leave intentionally, leave, you know, money to your local church that you love, um, great. But, uh, <coughs> Um, I guess even the issue of writing a will at all, m many people would think, well, we don't need to do any estate planning. I don't need to write a will. I'm, you know, I'm only 30 or I'm only 50 or I'm only 60. Well, in, in modern times, only 60 seems pretty young, right? Anyway, so deliberately after other priorities are handled, after people are shifting out of hysteria and paranoia um, and having, or they're, they're having paranoia deliberately by measures, not by just being, you know, uh, rattled by the media, but they're actually studying things closely, double checking, and if they have a degree of caution or paranoia, it's, it's, uh, um, something that they can look at as, I want to be attentive to risks. I want to know what's the risk of my food. What's the risk of my um, uh, my occupation? If there are in occupational risks, somebody may want to know. They might have gotten into the field without researching it, but once they get into it and they think, well, do I want to do this for another 15 years? Well, how about I research the occupational risks? Maybe I should go into something that's related but a little less dangerous. I'm just making that up, you know, uh, in case somebody has some occupational hazard in their job, but um, whatever the case may be, there's nothing wrong with paranoia. The idea is if we have a sense of fear, can we take action that clarifies what is the risk and then can we minimize the risk? And if, if not, then we can just maintain caution. We don't really need to worry as an agonize like how do I change reality to be how it should be. We just can focus on how can I move towards what's safe? How can I maintain safety? If I'm driving uh, in an area where I know that there could be deer, what's the appropriate speed? So that's not paranoia to be wondering where are the, where are the dangerous areas relative to deer. So once we're really mindful about it, it's not paranoia. Paranoia almost has to do with this scattered jumping from thing to thing you know, I'm scared of everything. That's what we associate with paranoia. I'm scared that the government's going to do this. I'm scared that the uh, uh, my wife is going to do that. And I'm scared that my neighbor's going to do that. Like somebody with clinical paranoia has a bunch of erratic worries that they jump around from. So to be cautious about driving while you're driving and then to be cautious about um, uh, your your medical choices uh, when you have a medical situation, those individual cautions are not paranoia. Not how I think of paranoia. Um, so that is the prepared portion. Um, I want uh, a final word or comment from uh, everybody. Who's first? We haven't heard from Shelly in a while. Are you awake, Shelly? 
Uh oh. I am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us the final comment or, Can you hear me? or yeah? Uh, there must be a delay. Um, no, I appreciated what you wrote. Um, we went over today. It was it made a lot of sense, and it certainly helps with uh, agonizing, just like exactly what Daniel said earlier. It helps with um, interpreting or, or living in this world without agonizing over the uh, the way it's set up. Yeah, and I also think to note that when we start to study these things, these issues, we want to go at a pace that works for us, and we want to we want to keep it private or selective in regard to who we share it with. It's not for everybody. This is not something. That's why I was asking about uh, Dan's son. If you wanted Dan's son to hear all this stuff and to be part of this conversation, and it's it's not that. Uh, it would be upsetting, but it's, you know, some of it's, it's a, it's mature subject matter for the average 15 year old, you know, and it might be subject matter that's a little challenging for a 50 year old or a 60 year old or a 70 year old, but as time goes on, uh, some of this subject matter is going to be of interest to, to some people. And, uh, the big thing with, with agonizing, as I said, is, expectations once we have a gentle relaxed view of expectations like of course we're gonna have expectations I'll if some of my expectations are wrong I don't need to defend them I can just update them or I can even just set them aside it's okay to be confused it's okay to be ignorant I don't need to know who should I vote for the media tells me it's either got to be this or that well, I can say, you know what, I really, I haven't researched that issue. I'm going to abstain. So, closing comments from Dan. J.R., how do you define blowing through it? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I... Um, I think I, I find myself, uh, you know, at stage one of moments and, sure. and you know, at, at this time, maybe at, at stage two of moments as well. So, you know, I, I've gotten a lot from this uh, talk and I appreciate it. All right, cool. Um, Even yeah. though you don't know how to define blown through it. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I, 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 uh, I have a sense of humor about it. I, I, I asked you guys permission. How long is it, do you know how long it's been since I asked you? Did you look at the clock? Well, well speaking... Like, uh, two hours? Two hours since I said we're going to blow through the... Five minutes? Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see. Wow. I don't know. Yeah, now we're almost... So the entire... I think it's like 40 minutes since you said that. Okay. Something like 40 minutes since I said that. So, uh... Anyway... Cool, cool. I appreciate your exaggeration and your admitting that it was, that it was uh, fraudulent. Um... <laughs> What, what was I going to say? So, um, next week we'll be talking about time management, and um, it's only going to be a, a 45 minute um, uh, call, so uh, make sure you've got 45 minutes closely marked out in your schedule. Um, actually, next week we're not available on Tuesday, so uh, I'm going to stop recording here, and we will get on to plans for next week. Um, what day do you guys uh, 